There's still a lot of mysteries around a lot of things that happened in this country. In the night, up came a person who was wearing a cloak and he had in his hands the great seal of the United States. Jefferson, of course, looked at it and said, this is it. It's a very dangerous thing to reveal the truth, but we have to. Let's go back to a really important individuals here. His name is Nicholas Rorick. The truncated pyramid uh, with the all-seeing eye on the top, Nicholas Rorick is the person who is responsible for that ending up on the dollar bill. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the President of the United States, and Henry Wallace was the, the Secretary of Agriculture. Now, Henry Wallace was deeply involved in the occult. Rorick, to Wallace, to FDR, to the dollar bill. I was initiated into this very ancient order. Here we are at the Nicholas Rorick Museum. Do you really think it has anything to do with the Illuminati? The owl is the totem symbol of the Illuminati. Yes, because Rorick was the Illuminati. They all seem to have been Masons. His son was murdered. Those who normally get out, they're killed. Hexagrams are used during occult ceremonies when you're summoning up demons. Because we're dealing with Lucifer. And the all-seeing eye of God is one of the emblems that the Freemasons use. He said, are you trying to say that masonry is evil? I said, it comes right out of the same pit of hell. Didn't win a lot of friends that day. Our history of the dollar bill is a strange telling, one that involves an American president, a former vice president, a mysterious Russian mystic, and a determined Jewish researcher on the trail of an ancient artifact that is said to have been in the possession of the most powerful rulers in history and somehow directly influenced the design of the dollar bill. As incredible as it seems, it's believed this mysterious object could mark the beginning of Armageddon. There's gonna be a bloodbath there. With them is an expert in the signs and symbols of the occult world. This is not the eagle. Who claims that the details of the dollar bill are no accident, but represent the diabolical working of secret societies. This is the eye of a phoenix looking on in favor of the secrets of the dollar bill Most debates about the design of the dollar bill usually involve the founding fathers of America, but it's important to remember that they only designed a great seal. There are many details to the dollar bill that go far beyond the seal itself. The great seal was developed through three committees involving a total of 14 men. But in the end, the work was submitted in June of 1782 by essentially one man. Charles Thompson. What is little known is that while Thompson presented a preliminary sketch, his final design was submitted to Congress only in the form of a written description. Looking at the rough drawings Thompson put together with artist William Barton, it becomes clear that many of the specific details of the seal as we know it today were added later on. For example, above the head of the American Eagle are 13 stars that form a six-pointed hexagram. While Thompson's description called for the 13 stars, their hexagram formation was not part of his original description and is not present in the earliest realizations of the design. The hexagram seems to have been added in the 20th century. The nature of the Great Seal is so mysterious that some believe that it came from a supernatural force. An account recorded by Dr. Robert Hieronymus in his book, Founding Fathers Secret Societies, says that the Great Seal was given to Thomas Jefferson by a mysterious cloaked figure. I love that story. The Founding Fathers were trying to get the Great Seal of the United States designed. They needed 
to have a design for the Great Seal to represent our nation. And Jefferson went outside in the night and up came a person, an individual who was wearing a cloak whom he couldn't totally see and he had in his hands the Great Seal of the United States. And he basically said, or this being said, you know, you're struggling over the symbol for our nation. Here it is. The account reads that Jefferson told a strange story. A man approached him wearing a black cloak that practically covered him face and all, and told him that he, the strange visitor, knew they were trying to devise a seal, and that he had a design which was appropriate and meaningful. Jefferson, of course, looked at it, according to this story, and, and said, this is it. This is it. I, he knew it was it, and it was right. So he supposedly came running back into whatever, whether it was a tent or whatever it was, and he showed it to uh, other individuals, and he told them about, they met this, this person outside. Of course, they went outside to go to find a guy, and he's gone. He, the, you know, so supposedly they'll never find out who designed the Great Seal of the United States. While Dr. Hieronymus admits that he is skeptical about such stories, there are others who claim to believe them to this day. Perhaps it has something to do with John Adams, who was on the first SEAL committee with Thomas Jefferson. According to the written account, John Adams was there when this bizarre event took place. Oddly enough, the Adams Memorial in Washington, D.C. is adorned with this mysterious cloaked figure. Perhaps it's just a coincidence. The first historical account of the Great Seal's design was written by a 19th century American Army officer named Charles A. L. Totten. In his book on the secret symbols of the dollar bill, Masonic author David Ovison writes that Totten equated the birth of the United States with the beginnings of what he called the New Atlantis, a title given to a work by Sir Francis Bacon one of the mysterious financial backers of the Virginia colony. Ovison goes on to write that the Great Seal and the Dollar Bill represent the most extraordinary example in history of the public evolution of a magical design. Even as Sir Francis Bacon and his contemporary, Dr. John Dee, were said to be in contact with the spirit realm, there are those who believe that it is this dimension that has been guiding the course of America and the so-called evolution of the dollar bill. Debates have gone on for years about the secret symbolism of the Great Seal of the United States, whether or not these symbols represent secret societies, or if they are what the White House and the U.S. Congress currently tell us, symbols of divine providence, of stability, and the patriotism of America. What the Founding Fathers intended as they designed and ultimately approved of the Great Seal remains mostly a mystery. There's still a lot of mysteries around a lot of things that happened in this country. It's not, not in our history books. There can be no doubt that those things hidden in the shadows of the last two centuries are not easily brought to light. But when one comes into the modern era, into the age of photography, film, and the advanced practices of mass media, it becomes a bit easier to document world events and the intentions of those who have helped to shape them. In the late 19th century, Harvard professor Charles Eliot Norton referred to the Great Seal as a dull emblem of the Masonic fraternity. This idea was furthered by a cult philosopher, Manley P. Hall, in the early part of the 20th century. Hall not only believed that the Great Seal was Masonic, 
but that it was created through the collective consciousness of the occult societies and represented the secret destiny that they had in mind for America. I'd say that he saw the secret destiny of America as the beginning of a world democracy and that this was a kind of um, an experiment in democracy that had been envisioned for thousands of years before. So he saw this much like Francis Bacon envisioned what he called the New Atlantis. In 1926, Hall began publishing a newspaper called The All-Seeing Eye, dedicated to his occult views of philosophy. It was during Hall's era that the all-seeing eye of the Great Seal would be taken out of obscurity and placed on the back of the dollar bill by President Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1935. This might all be seen as just a coincidence, if not for the fact that FDR seemed to be familiar with Hall's teachings on the occult. Well, it has a lot to do, let's go back to really important individuals here. His name is Nicholas Rorick. And Nicholas Rorick um, was a very um, advanced spiritual soul with considerable vision. Nicholas Rorick was also a Rosicrucian. He was also a member of other secret societies. Rorick was a Russian painter and mystic who was deeply involved in theosophy and the teachings of Madame H.P. Blavatsky. He is famous for his travels into Tibet and the Far East in search of the legendary kingdom of Shambhala. But what was his relationship to FDR's Secretary of Agriculture? I believe that Nicholas Work was a spiritual teacher, not a supreme spiritual teacher, but was a teacher of Henry Asgard Wallace. Rorick was considered not only a teacher, but a spiritual mentor and guru to Henry Wallace. It's believed that Wallace recommended the Great Seal to FDR because of the mystical influence Rorick held over him. The dollar bill was approved with the all-seeing eye and the, and the truncated pyramid uh, with the all-seeing eye on the top of the, um, because of uh, Nicholas Rorick. In the book, Tournament of Shadows, the authors document much of the activities and influence of Rorick during this period. They write that Rorick's influence was suspected in the adornment of the $1 bill with a verso of the great seal showing a pyramid crowned by an all-seeing eye. The story of Wallace's role with FDR is told by the State Department in an official history called The Eagle and the Shield, a history of the Great Seal of the United States. Henry Wallace, while sitting in the State Department, found a booklet on the Great Seal of the United States. Wallace recollects that day in letters he wrote in 1951 and in 1955. He says, Turning to page 53, I noted the colored reproduction of the reverse side of the seal. The Latin phrase Novus Ordo Seclorum impressed me as meaning the New Deal of the Ages. If in terms of the dollar, if there's a code uh, about uh, the New World Order, um, I think that they jumped a few decades from the New Deal, because the, the, the Novus Ordum Seculorum can be translated to the New Deal in English as easily and readily as to the New Order or the New World Order. Initially, Wallace envisioned the Great Seal appearing on a coin. He took the idea to President Roosevelt. So when Henry Wallace saw this booklet and saw this pyramid in the Iron Triangle, he was a Freemason. He was a member of a secret society. Immediately he said, whoa, what a symbol to have uh, and not use. Let's use this. So it was he that went to uh, the president, FDR, and FDR, being a Freemason, looked at those symbols and said, hey, yes, wow, this is, you know, this is, uh, this is a, this new order of the ages, what's the new deal? He used, he actually thought to a degree 
that the uh, new Nova Soda Sacrum was the New Deal. Wallace wrote that Roosevelt, as he looked at the colored reproduction of the seal, was first struck with the all-seeing eye, a Masonic representation of the great architect of the universe. Next, he was impressed with the idea that the foundation for the new order of the ages had been laid in 1776, but that it would be completed only under the eye of the great architect. Roosevelt, like myself, was a 32nd degree Mason. He suggested that the seal be put on the dollar bill rather than a coin and took the matter up with the Secretary of the Treasury. The Secretary of the Treasury at the time was Henry Morgenthau. And he uh, talked to Henry Morgenthau, who was the Secretary of the Treasury, and got him convinced that we should put this esoteric emblem uh, from the back of the uh, Great Seal of the United States onto the back of the dollar bill. This really symbolized the fact that now the esoteric influence dominated the American government. And, and Morgenthau, uh, the Secretary of Treasury, uh, wrote extensively about this point, and he said there's some strange cabal, some mystical order behind the scenes, uh, uh, you know, calling shots on, on the, on the uh, artwork uh, that appears now on our dollar bills. He had to approve it, and he later had found out that, that, uh, that this was all Henry Wallace's, it was all based on Henry Wallace's relationship to Nicholas Rorick. Nicholas Rorick is the person who uh, is responsible for that ending up on the dollar bill. The stone is said to be the pillow stone of Jacob, upon which he had his dream of a ladder that stretched from earth to heaven, with the angels of God ascending and descending on it. The ladder itself is a recurring symbol in secret societies, especially Freemasonry. Master Mason Albert Pike wrote extensively of Jacob's Ladder in his book, Morals and Dogma, and even suggests that Jacob's Ladder may in fact have been a pyramid. The book of Genesis tells us that when Jacob awoke from his dream, he took the stone and set it up for a pillar. And he said, this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. As a result, some have come to believe that God, or the power of God, resides in the stone itself. From there, the legends vary, but one account says that the prophet Jeremiah took the stone and carried it into Scotland, where eventually the Scottish kings were crowned upon it. In late March 1306, Robert the Bruce was enthroned as King of Scots at Scone in Perthshire. An old Scottish poem says, Except old seers do feign and wizard wits be blind, the Scots in place must reign where they this stone shall find. Eventually, the stone was kept at Scone Palace and was hence called the Stone of Scone. To this day, the Scots also call it the Stone of Destiny. In the year 1296, King Edward I of England captured the stone and it was taken to Westminster Abbey for the crowning of English monarchs. In this picture, you can see the stone itself in the compartment beneath the coronation chair, a chair that was specifically built to house the Stone of Destiny. The last monarch to be crowned upon it was Queen Elizabeth II in 1953. But in 1997, the English supposedly returned the ancient stone to the Scots, with the understanding that the future monarchs of England would continue to be crowned upon it. Today, the stone is said to be housed inside Edinburgh Castle in Scotland.
There is even a self-guided tour where visitors can view the Stone of Destiny along with the honors of Scotland, the crown jewels of Scottish royalty. According to the tour guide we spoke with while there, this is the legendary stone. But if this is true, then how could the stone have ended up inside a casket in the hands of Nicholas Rorick? The answer, given by Buff Perry and others, is that the stone currently at Edinburgh is a fake. Uh, the stone of scone, because uh, the, the one that's actually in Edinburgh Castle is a fake, and most Scots know it because once the English came and stole it once, they were never going to be stolen again. <laughs> so the one that's actually in the castle is not real. Others, like Alex Salmond, the first minister of Scotland, claim that the stone taken by the English king in 1296 was a fake, and that the real stone was somehow hidden away secretly by the Scots. Exactly where the real stone of destiny is today and how it may have changed hands over the centuries continues to be a matter of debate. Nevertheless, its importance is recognized by nearly all occult societies in the world today. It is the foundation stone of all history. It's also called the Philosopher's Stone. Um, it, it, ha it has met the Lapis Exilis in the Grail uh, literature cycles that came out of Kratium Detroit and, and uh, Wolfram von Eschenbach. Uh, it, Wolfram von Eschenbach writes in Parsifal that uh, the stone is called the Grail. While the Holy Grail is traditionally thought of as the Cup of Christ, those involved in secret societies believe that the original and oldest form of the Grail is the Stone of Destiny written of by Wolfram von Eschenbach in his Grail legend, Parsifal. And he calls it Lapis Exilis, which is a, a way of saying the exiled or wandering stone. Uh, he does that uh, because of the history known in Freemasonry and in the secret societies of this stone's movement around here and there and where it would be would, would, would indicate the importance of that place. The stone, mentioned in Eschenbach's Grail legend, is a green stone that some believe is similar to a type of meteorite known as Moldavite. This description is said to have been confirmed by Nicholas Rorick while he claimed to have the stone in his possession. The secret societies believe that this stone that supposedly fell from heaven empowers that person or place of its location. And it has to do with the secret history of America and why that stone arrived here, who brought it. As we showed earlier, Dr. Obadiah Harris referred to it as the foundation stone of America. What is the significance of the uh, foundation stone of America? Well, the foundation stone is really about, is about what America is about uh, and also what England seems to be about. And uh, so it's really, it implies the great mysteries that was contained in the great mystery schools and of those who had this vision. Was it this mystery school vision that guided FDR and his fellow Mason, Henry Wallace, as they set the all-seeing eye of the great architect on the back of the dollar bill. When one considers the repeated use of the word destiny by Manley Hall, who wrote of the secret destiny of America, along with FDR, who had knowledge of Hall's library and who said that Americans had a rendezvous with destiny, and then Henry Wallace, who referred to America itself as the land of destiny. It only makes sense that such men would have taken an interest in the stone of destiny. That Henry Wallace had an interest in seeking the Holy Grail is proven by the letters he wrote to Nicholas Rorick. As a Freemason, he would have seen an occult connection with America 
since the Stone of Destiny is said to have come from heaven to earth, from the dog star Sirius. It seems clear that their secret mission had to do with creating a one world order through the League of Nations and by supporting the New Deal, which both FDR and Henry Wallace believed was the new order of the ages. It was during FDR's administration that the National Archives building was completed, with the figure of what appears to be a perfected man carved upon it. The figure is called Destiny. With the word destiny used repeatedly by the key figures who influenced the dollar bill, FDR, Wallace, and Manley Hall, is it possible that they all believed the stone of destiny had come to America through Nicholas Rorick? But exactly what destiny they had in mind for America and the world must give us pause when we consider the full history of the stone. According to an ancient legend, the stone that fell from heaven is a jewel that was cut from the crown of Lucifer himself. Commenting on this, Manly P. Hall writes that the Lapis Exilis, crown jewel of the Archangel Lucifer, fell from heaven. Michael, Archangel of the Sun, at the head of the angelic hosts, swooped down upon Lucifer. During the conflict, Michael with his sword struck the flashing Lapis Exilis from the coronet of his adversary, and the green stone fell into the dark and immeasurable abyss. Paul goes on to say that out of Lucifer's radiant gem was fashioned the Sangreal, or Holy Grail, from which Christ is said to have drunk at the Last Supper. This idea seems to be captured in this depiction of the Grail by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Rossetti was a 19th century esoteric painter who is said to have influenced modern Rosicrucianism. He may well have been familiar with the ancient legend, since his Grail cup appears to be a dark emerald green mounted in a golden frame. But according to the various legends that are told, this stone of Lucifer was divided into different parts. One part became the Grail Chalice, while King Solomon is said to have fashioned another part into a ring. Yet another part became the Stone of the Kaaba. While this stone is black, Manley Hall suggests that Islam venerates the color green because of its association with the Grail Stone. Others believe the Grail Stone is the same as the Emerald Tablet. A depiction of this tablet can be found in the floor mosaic of the Cathedral of Siena, next to an image of Hermes Trismegistus, or Hermes Thrice Great. As such, it is known as the Emerald Tablet of Hermes. Written upon it is the Hermetic Maxim, that which is below is like that which is above. The tablet is also called the Philosopher's Stone and is well known in the ancient world. Sir Isaac Newton even did his own transcription of the Emerald Tablet. In the modern world, Carl Jung is said to have had dreams of the Emerald Tablet. Manley Hall obviously knew about it and even published his own illustration. Hall writes that the oldest and most revered of all the alchemical formulae is the sacred Emerald Tablet of Hermes. In her book on the Merovingian mythos, occult author Tracy Twyman writes that the story of the Emerald Tablet of Hermes appears to be yet another incarnation of the Grail as stone. She goes on to say, the legend connected to these items and the stone they came from relate that the stone bounced off Cain's head as it fell to earth, leaving a scar on his forehead in the shape of a red serpent, the mark of Cain. This is what the Grail as stone represents. 
Meanwhile, Nicholas Rorick called his stone a Chintamani, an example of which is shown in this image of a Buddhist figure who holds a greenish Chintamani stone in his hand. While the legends of these stones vary and researchers often disagree, it is curious that both Rorick and Manley Hall use the same variant spelling of Eschenbach's term for the Grail Stone. Eschenbach uh, uh, wrote La Psyte Exilis rather than La Peace Exilis. In each of their writings, both Rorick and Hall use the term La Peace Exilis. This might be written off as mere coincidence, if not for the fact that Hall was meeting with Rorick in the upper penthouse of the master building. This suggests that they had the same understanding of the stone. Furthermore, both men were involved, along with Henry Wallace, in the theosophical teachings of Madame H.P. Blavatsky, who openly asserted the ancient Gnostic belief that the true God is Lucifer. As such, for Rorick to have a piece of Lucifer's gemstone would have had great significance. Dr. Obadiah Harris explained to us the importance of Madame Blavatsky to Manley Hall and to his writings about the founding and destiny of America. There's another important lady over here that um Mr. Hall wanted to honor, and that is Helen Blavatsky, a Russian woman. By the way, her little house in Russia, and I understand now, is a national museum. But in the early days, uh, he wanted to pay tribute to her contribution, and she was the co-founder of the Theosophical Society, whose headquarters now is in, is in India. Um, she, she wrote Isis Unveiled, um, The Secret Doctrine, and it is said, I don't know if this is true, but it, cause she, she died in 1891. Manny Hall was born in 1901, but it is said that he had read The Secret Doctrine by the time he was 12 years old and understood it. So there's a, a, a feeling that Manley Hall had a, had a bond with this woman, a kind of spiritual bond, and that when he wrote Secret Teachings of America, he was really writing the next book for her secret teaching, secret doctrine, that he was taking it farther, and he did. So he, he felt that in her was a kind of something of the isthmus of the spirit that gave birth to the Philosophical Research Society. If what Dr. Harris says is true, then Hall founded his entire society on the Luciferian doctrines of Madame H.P. Blavatsky. Well, Manley Hall, of course, really was one of the leaders of this whole world esoteric movement for, you know, for probably 70 years or more and he wrote extensively about the, the ancient mysteries, and he eventually joined the Masons and, of course, moved up very rapidly to 33rd degree Mason, and then to the upper levels of Masonry, which are truly into the Luciferian, which most Masons have no idea even exists. In his writings, Hall said that when the Mason learns the mystery of his craft, the seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. This quote comes from the book the Lost Keys of Freemasonry that was first published in 1923, the same year the casket had been delivered to the Roricks in Paris. The Luciferian Freemasonry described by Hall could very well have been known by such Masons as Henry Wallace and FDR, especially if FDR was so familiar with Hall that he sent emissaries to Hall's library. Also consider that FDR's successor, Harry Truman, a fellow Mason, had Hall's books on his shelves. And certainly, Manley Hall's view of La Pis Exilis as the gemstone of Lucifer would not likely have escaped the attention of Nicholas Rorick.
Despite Rorick's international mystique and influence in the Oval Office, he eventually suffered a sudden and sharp decline. While searching for seeds and grasses for the Department of Agriculture, he was also heavily involved with the politics of Central Asia. Buff Perry believes that prior to his fall, Rorick was working to amalgamate the countries of Asia into a united Buddhist theocracy that would ultimately be joined to a one-world government. In Nicholas Rorick's efforts to bring about an amalgamated, if you will, theocratic Buddhist nation that would have consisted of Manchuria, Mongolia, Tibet, part of China, perhaps part of India, perhaps some of Siberia, uh, he, he was working with the Tashi Lama who was uh, suspected by China, particularly, and to this day very much suspected by China, um, you know, as being uh, subversive to the stability of the region. And as a result of this, uh, Rorick became associated with, with accusations of, uh, of uh, espionage. Perry's further suspicion is that, at least for a time, Rorick's political efforts were on behalf of FDR's New Deal administration. We recorded the following conversation with Perry in December of 2008. So we've got the, the uh, uh, what nobody's talking about right now in American media, the North American Union, right, through the free right. agreement, the European Union, which is known about, but we never hear about it on the news. Right. And now there's an, uh, this Asian Union. It seems like Rorick was being used by the American government to lay the foundation for or to bring about an Asian Union. You've got it. That I, I accept wholeheartedly. And I, and I think it's it, it, when you read it, the details, factual details, it, it, it's inescapable that America saw in Rorick the, 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 the capability of creating this great Asian Union. And he was supported by American intelligence. Rorick was supported when he was trying to bring together that great new nation. He, who was he reporting to? He was reporting to the, the American consulates in China. The official story seems to be that once Rorick was accused of being a spy, he fell out of favor with his two greatest supporters, Henry Wallace and Louis Horch. But what about Rorick's so-called Stone of Destiny, this holy grail that he claimed was in his possession, supposedly buried inside the cornerstone of the Master Building? Whether the stone or some part of it is there or not, Buff Perry has come to the conclusion that Rorick's artifact was a cunningly devised fable. Just for our audience, just you don't buy into the idea of the mystical, magical nature of this stone. Absolutely not. And and you think it was a, a showpiece uh, fabricated by the Roricks, really to beguile guys like Henry Wallace, it seems like. Yes. I do. I do. I do. When we first interviewed Buff several years ago, he seemed to have the impression that the Stone of Destiny was the same stone that Rorick had in his possession. Today, he believes they are not at all the same thing, and that perhaps this is what caused Wallace to become disillusioned with his guru. I think Wallace uh, felt perhaps deceived when he's anticipating the arrival of what he called the Stone of Destiny in correspondence uh, and then ends up with, you know, nothing in effect. Nevertheless, Perry still believes that Jacob's Pillow Stone, which is said to be the real Stone of Destiny, was brought to America by the Jacobites and may have been recovered by the French-Canadian explorer La Verandry in the 1700s. The, the La Verandry Stone is, a, you know, clearly has some association with the Stone of Destiny. But the whereabouts of the stone today are still unknown. As a Jewish researcher, 
the real stone holds special significance for Buff Perry. According to the Jewish belief, the pillow stone of Jacob is one of the original artifacts that was kept in King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. The stone, variously called the Stone of Destiny, Foundation Stone, Pillow Stone of Jacob, and other titles, is expected and is necessary uh, to be in Jerusalem for the final construction of the final temple. The Jews believe that that temple, and not all Jews, but most of the Jews today, active in rabbinical orders that are preparing to, you know, conduct all the rituals in the final temple as we speak, um, believe that all articles that were in Solomon's temple have to be returned if they're known to exist. If they're not known to exist, then it's a different matter. But all those that are known to exist must be returned and would then go into use again in the final temple. Buff believes that Nicholas and Helena Rorick aligned their Chintamani stone with the Stone of Destiny in order to sensationalize their own cause. But others continue to believe that Rorick's stone was from the stars and had real power. The Roricks themselves were known for tapping into the supernatural realm. Uh, the Roricks were particularly eccentric. Helena Rorick spent much of her lifetime channeling a spirit that called itself Master Mariah, the same spirit that inspired Madame Blavatsky to declare that Lucifer was God. We told you earlier about the letter from Zina Fosdick that describes the contents of the Rajput casket placed inside the cornerstone of the master building. But we neglected to mention a few of the items that Buff Perry talked about. But there are all kinds of other ingredients. There are different fabrics and coins. And, and what's, the, what's the thing? Talk about the coins again. Well, these are, uh, in some cases, coins that materialized out of what would be considered occultation, out of, out of the other world in, in different meetings and sessions that were held uh, by the Rorix. And... I'm not saying this uh, off the cuff or because I heard it from someone else. These are recorded memoirs of Helena and Nicholas Rorick. And of course, many of the people who are into the New Age are into astral projection and in contact with these spirit beings. And there really are spirit beings out there. They refer to them as the masters of wisdom or the great white brotherhood or the enlightened ones, and they believe that they are guiding society. These are actually demonic forces uh, and demonic beings, and of course they can materialize and disappear. The average individual says, oh, that can't be true, and yet it is true. And when you talk to the people who are dealing with this, they come in contact with this many times. They have accessed this other dimension, which is truly a demonic dimension, and of course, Tragically, it's becoming increasingly apparent here in America as we turn our back on God, and we're not really a secular society. We've gone from being a Christian society to a secular society, and now a society dominated by the occult forces of which are intent upon ruling the world. If it's true that the Roricks were in contact with the spirit realm, is it then possible that these same powers could have somehow influenced the design of the dollar bill. While the history surrounding FDR's administration is disturbing, there is said to be a darker level and one that is openly satanic in the design of the dollar bill. These allegations begin with a group founded in Bavaria in 1776 known as the Illuminati. The order was founded by a man named Adam Weishaupt with the alleged purpose of perfecting society. The symbolism of the dollar bill, Adam Weishaupt, do you really think it has anything to do with the Illuminati, in your opinion? 
is the Illuminati to be defined as Freemasons and Rosicrucians and other uh, secret society members? If that's the case, then yes, I believe the the symbol on the dollar bill, the truncated pyramid, is directly related to the Illuminati because Rorick was the Illuminati. In the 18th century, the original order was thought to have a bloodthirsty agenda, and it was believed that they secretly worshipped Lucifer. George Washington warned about the Illuminati in his letters, while Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin were thought to be members of its inner circle. Which brings us to our next speaker. He claims to have been raised in a modern Illuminati family that dates back to the 1700s. He says that, as a child, he was made to practice black magic and witchcraft. His name is Doc Marquis. My family goes back into the Illuminati all the way back to 1789. Of course, we have no way of either confirming or denying Doc's claims, but it is worth noting that he has acted as an expert on the occult for law enforcement and the FBI. According to his publisher, in the past he has appeared on and consulted for Geraldo Rivera and Oprah Winfrey, and for shows like Hard Copy, Inside Edition, and Unsolved Mysteries. Doc has been a Christian since 1979, but he says that part of his upbringing in a family that worshipped Lucifer was to be taught about the secret Illuminati symbols of the dollar bill, and that understanding them begins with the Rothschild dynasty. Maya Amsha Rothschild had made a very interesting and profound statement. He said, allow me to control and issue the money of a nation and I care not who writes its laws. And he was right. Meyer Amschel Rothschild is called the founding father of international finance. In 2005, Forbes magazine ranked him seventh on their list of the 20 most influential businessmen of all time. All this happened um, back in 1776. And this was during May 1st and shortly thereafter. The significance behind that is that on May 1st, 1776, Dr. Adam Weishaupt, who was a defrocked Jesuit um, priest, who was given the chair of the professorship of religious um, studies at Ingolstadt University, was approached by Maya Amschel Bauer, who would later change his last name to Rothschild, along with 12 of his most financially influential friends. They knew Weishaupt at that particular time was not only a genius when it came to the occult world, but Weishaupt also had an axe to grind because it was the Catholic Church that just recently defrocked him. He was no longer a Jesuit priest and he was going to send a message to them, to the monarchies of Europe and to all other people who would try to have their will over his. What Rothschild and Weisopt came up with was a plan to destroy the old world system of government through monarchies and the church and to set up a new world order in its place. This is said to be the great plan of all the secret societies. So what happened? My Angel Bauer approached Weisopt and basically told him we know you've got the occult knowledge and genius to put it all together. We've got the money. You do it, we'll back it. Just to paraphrase what would really happen. So in 1773, Weishaupt started creating what had never been created before. The idea of Illuminism had always been around, ever since the days of Babylon, with the co-founders of being that Nimrod and Semiramis but no one had ever been able to actualize it. However, May 1st, 1776, the order of the Illuminati had become a reality under the auspices of Dr. Adam Weishaupt. Now, like other nations, orders, countries and such, they have their two great seals. The order of the Illuminati does. 
Those two seals can be found on the back of a one dollar bill. People mistake those to be the two great seals of the United States of America. They are not. Those are the two seals of the Order, order of the Illuminati. And I'm going to explain it to you. In order to understand the seal itself, we have to first take a look at every single thing that composites it. We look at the first part of it on, on our left, which would be the truncated pyramid one. Above it is a 13-letter Latin expression that says annuate corruptus. And directly underneath the base of the pyramid is a three-word Latin expression, which is novus ordo seclorum. If you were to look up the word, let's say work, in the English um, um, dictionary, you're going to find at least 50 different meanings for it. It is the same thing in Latin. Different words have different meanings. They have more than one meaning. Um, the word seclorum, one of the definitive meanings is it is um, secular. Something that is secular is of the world. So it is proper, very proper, to translate the bottom as new world order, the novus order seclorum. The whole of it is saying, announcing the birth of a new world order. This would be Dr. Adam Weishaupt himself, the very first head of the Order of the Illuminati. It was Weishaupt who had himself come up with a seven-part plan to create what he called the Novus Ordo Seclorum, or the New World Order. This is the person responsible for it. The interesting thing about the front of the dollar bill is that there are four huge ones. There is one in every single corner. Now if we look at each of every single one of them, they each have an oval around it, except for the top right hand one. Now if we look at this blow up version of it, you will find there is no oval. This is a shield that is surrounding the one. Now, the reason there was a shield here is because this is very similar to the original shield that was given to the Rothschild family when Baron Maya Amschel Rothschild had become um, knighted in England and received the lordship. If we look across the top of this shield, all the way to the left-hand side, it drops down and forms a crescent moon. It's a crescent moon because it represents the female goddess in the occult world. At the bottom of that shield, of the, excuse me, of that lunar moon, you will see the owl. And it's very obvious, once you take a good look at that part of the crescent moon, and it is the same Illuminati owl that is being worshipped at the Bohemian Grove in California by those members of the Bohemian Grove, where presidents, premiers, kings and queens and heads of nations throughout this world have met. You can tell just by looking at this photo, that is a 40-foot owl, it is made out of oak, and that the worshippers are surrounding that fire pit around that altar, which is easily reflected in the lake around them. This is definitely the owl of the Illuminati. The rituals performed at the Bohemian Grove are occult and idolatrous. One of them, called the Cremation of Care, is supposed to be a mock human sacrifice, though some suggest that real killings take place. When President Nixon was there, he commented about the extreme homosexual environment at this all-male boys club. Among other powerful American leaders who have been spotted at the Grove are Ronald Reagan, Dwight Eisenhower, Jimmy Carter, Newt Gingrich, and George Bush, Jr. and Sr. Now, when we take a look at the O, it is actually, occultically speaking, the shape of the Ouroboros, the snake that's going around in a circle, devouring itself. This O is actually the eye in this lady's face that they want to look at. This is the O. Now, what's in the center of this O? You take a good look. It is the exact same owl of the Illuminati that we saw on the back of the $1 bill. So the question then becomes, 
who owns L'Oreal. But the owl seems to be a major symbol for the secret societies, as they are found repeatedly inside government buildings in Washington, D.C. And a giant owl figure is even seen in the street design, with the United States Capitol in the midst of it. Now the Druids um, from um, the Gaelic means, Druid means men of oak. These people worshiped creation among other things, but um, their sacred symbol was the owl because the ancient god of magic and of the hunt was Pallas Athena. Her bird was the owl and that owl represented wisdom it always has. Pallas Athena was also the goddess figure who was said to inspire Sir Francis Bacon. But now look at this owl seal at the Bohemian Grove, where it says, weaving spiders come not here. While the line is taken from Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream, could this also be a veiled reference to what seems like a spider web design that forms the background of the dollar bill? Are there additional secrets hidden there? Now, I'm sure you've heard of um, a Rorschach smear or the Rorschach ink block test as created by Dr. Rorschach himself. Um, you see the ink in the forefront and everything else is in the background. This way your subconscious mind is supposed to pick up on what's on the foreground and you're supposed to be able to tell what you are subconsciously seeing. Notice how it's very busy. Lot of intersection diagonally lines, you can't make out what's there. But let's get rid of the background noise, get rid of all the diagonal lines on, that doesn't belong there, and let's reverse the principle of Rorschach and take what's in the background and bring it to the forefront and see what's there. Because once we do that, we find out it's quite obvious that there is another Illuminati owl and that it is perched on something that looks like an arrow. That is what they don't want you to see. Once you see this owl here and compare it to the other one on the left hand side of it, it becomes very obvious that this is an owl. You can now begin to, to distinguish beyond all that busy signals and such that they don't want you to look through, yet they placed there in honor of the totem bird, the Isle of Wisdom, which is um, the totem bird because their god, Lucifer, was supposed to have been the wisest of all of God's creation. Wisdom of Lucifer, wisdom into the bird, wisdom into the word Illuminati. Therefore, you know, the chain of wisdom is followed all the way through. All right, now, did they teach you this in the Illuminati? Yes. Well, I want you to understand that the first symbol is known as a pentalpha, from the Greek word for five, pente. Um, it is a five-pointed star. Now, this next one is a pentacle. Now, it looks similar, but I want you to notice how it is interwoven. It runs through and in between itself. Now this next symbol is what's known as the Star of David, the Morgan David, the Jewish Star, the Seal of Solomon. There's numbers for it. This is the symbol for the nation of Israel. Now, when you take a look at it very carefully, you will notice that it is two equilateral triangles that are interwoven. This shows the union of God with man. However, when you look at the next one, it's similar to it. It's known as a hexagon. This is when you take two equilateral triangles, place one on top of another. Symbolically speaking, you're placing man above God. Now, this next symbol is the foulest, the most evil of all symbols in the occult world. There is nothing that can even come close. It is known as the hexagram. 
It is the six-pointed star with a circle surrounding it. It is this symbol that must be used during high ceremonial magic or high ceremonial witchcraft when you are summoning up demons to this plane of existence. The use of the hexagram is said by Doc to be very symbolic and seems to represent the occult concept of a Christ figure, just as the Maitreya was for Nicholas Rorick and Henry Wallace. But what Christ do they mean? Doc believes the pattern of hexagrams in the design of the dollar bill provides the clue. If we take a look at the 13 stars directly above the head of the eagle and connect the dots, you will see where the very first hexagram is located. And if you notice that Surrounding the hexagram is the 28 guidelines that make a circle. Now, inside every single point, the six points, is a star. There are six of them. They surround now the seven stars. Remember, six is the number of man, seven is the number of a god. Now, it is man that is surrounding God or is placed above God. If what Doc is saying is true, this could represent the person the Bible calls the man of sin, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. Doc's interpretation seems to also fit the worship of Lucifer, for in the Bible, Lucifer declares that he will exalt his throne above the stars of God. Next, Doc claims a second hexagram can be found by connecting the various points where the much talked about number 13 is represented. And don't try to tell me it's the 13 colonies. There are 13 stars above the eagle's head, 13 stripes in the shield, 13 leaves on the olive branch, 13 arrows in the eagle's talon, and then 13 letters in the phrase E Pluribus Uno which makes for two points on either side of the eagle's head for the six points total of the hexagram. If we take a close look at the same seal and connect all the 13 together, just like we did when we were kids, when we were playing that game, connect the dots. Once we connect all the 13s, it becomes very apparent where the second hexagram can be found. In this one, which is very obvious, already comes with a circle around it. So this is the second hexagram here in figure two? Yes. And then where's the third hexagram? The third hexagram can be found on the other part of the great seal. Again, connect all the 13 together the 13 um, letters, the 13 um, steps in the pyramid, connect all this together. And you will note, with the circle that's already there, it forms the third hexagram. In other words, a six, a six, and a six. A six, six, Six. Doc has deciphered a code that, if there, would glorify Lucifer's Messiah, whom the Bible calls the Beast or Antichrist. In the book of Revelation, it reads, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Could there really be three six-pointed hexagrams on the dollar bill? Once we start at the base of the pyramid, which is the foundation of all things, and follow the design of the hexagram itself, you're going to find out something very startling. We go from the M and follow the symbol all the way up to the A, 
The A cuts directly underneath the eye of Lucifer all the way to the S. The S connects all the way down. It goes in between the V and the I and connects all the way to the O. And following the symbol, the O connects up and over along the symbol of the hexagram to the word N. In perfect sequence, it's M A S O N, Mason. It's not what a lot of other people have espoused that the symbol connects down to the M in Cichlorum and that the word is an anagram or something like that. Those people who are doing that obviously don't know what they're talking about or they don't know how to plagiarize me correctly because the order of the Illuminati have stated and always will state this is perfectly spelled out to be M A S O N Mason. This points conclusively that the Masons have been involved in the Order of the Illuminati. This was back during the Council of Willemsbad, which would have been July 16, 1782. All right, so what are we seeing? Now, if we look at the bottom one of the reverse side of the dollar bill, you'll see on the right-hand side that, again, there's a lot of busy intersecting diagonal lines. Yet, if we apply the same principle we just used to reveal the, the hidden owls of the Illuminati and apply it, we will find that there is now a skulled-faced winged demon. And it is very obvious once you take away the background, the busy noise, it becomes very apparent what it is and that it's been there all along. And if we just simply go and enlarge the, that section, just start with a small one and just keep enlarging it and enlarge it even more, even with the background noise there, as I call it, I think it becomes very apparent what we are now looking at, that it is still a skull-faced winged demon. And it is these demons that are protecting and blessing the two great seals of the Order of the Illuminati. And it would make perfect sense that it had to be demons used to protect these seals since I am convinced it was those same demons that hand them over to Thomas Jefferson when they first created them. I am convinced beyond all doubt that that indeed was a demon sent up from the bowels of hell, probably under the direct orders of Lucifer himself. Doc Marquis makes it clear that he is no longer involved in the occult and that since becoming a Christian, he has dedicated himself to warning others about the activities of the secret societies that worship Lucifer. I've been doing this now since the late 70s when I first left the Order of the Illuminati and that's when I'm, um, at that point I had become a born again Christian. At that time, I realized what I had um, been doing all along. Maybe in my own way of trying to make up for what I had done, and I've done a lot of heinous things in this life, I begin to wonder if I'm not trying to make up or atone for some of those things I had done. And I know in my heart of hearts that as a born again child of the king, my sins have already been bought and paid for. But still, there's just that part of me that still feels so guilty about everything I've done. So it could be in my own way, and I'm, I'm somewhat convinced that in my own way, I'm still trying to make up for all those crimes I was guilty of when I was in the Illuminati. Doc makes it clear that he believes demonic forces were behind the design of the dollar bill 
and are working through secret societies. One of them is the Order of the Eastern Star, the female chapter of Freemasonry, whose icon is an inverted pentagram, a symbol associated with the satanic goat of Mendes. Ed Decker told us a story about a woman he once counseled who was involved in this society. I got a call one day after I had published a book on it and a little book called The Question of Freemasonry. And in that book, I had on one page is the actual Goat of Mendes. The Goat of Mendes is a very significant symbol since it was designed by 19th century French magician, Eliphas Levi, without question, the most influential occultist of the last 200 years. In his books, Levi glorified Lucifer and Satan, and his writings were quoted extensively by every major occult leader, including Albert Pike, Madam H.P. Blavatsky, and Manley P. Hall. Now listen carefully to Ed Decker's story. I got a call from some place back in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and this is years ago, and a lady called me up and she said, I want to talk to you. She said, I received a copy of your book. I, I am a, uh, the, the head of the Eastern Star for my state. And she said, every time I go to uh, another area of the state to, to uh, do the induction of the leadership of the local chapters of the Eastern Star, I have these bad dreams and it's like this demon comes in and attacks me in my bedroom and it says, evil, evil thing. And it was beginning to bother me and someone mentioned to me that, you know, the Masons and the, and the stuff that they do isn't really godly. You might want to study it a little bit. She said, so she told me that she went to a Christian bookstore and asked them if they had anything on the Eastern Star or Freemasonry. And the lady said, you know, I, in the mail, I had just gotten this booklet. It's called The Question of Freemasonry by this guy, Ed Decker. And she said, I opened the book. I opened it up to the page. It just opened to the page that you have the goat of Mindy's on there. And I looked at that, and that's the demon that's been coming into my room and attacking me when I'm around, going around the state and doing the, the inductions of the ladies of the Eastern Star. She said, I ran down three blocks to my husband's office, left my car right in the parking lot of the Christian bookstore, ran down there, got my husband out of his, I think he was an insurance agent or something, and said, look at this. They left there, went home, read the book, got on their knees, confessed it as sin, renounced it, and had that thing taken off their back. And from that time on, all that heaviness left her. When it went away, it just moved off her entire spirit. It was a spirit of darkness and evil. And it was the goat of Mindy's, the same thing that's on the Medal of Honor, the same thing that's built into the Capitol and the Mall and the White House, built in there. It's the same evil spirit. This whole idea of the Messiah and its relation and the Messiah's relationship to the stone and who that Messiah would be and you know what would happen when the stone is returned to Jerusalem and when the temple is built it would be a, a, a replica of the original Solomon temple not the Ezekiel you know account so, which is so, what most Jews believe, the Ezekiel count. No Jews believe that the Solomon's Temple is going to be rebuilt in that architectural style. But the Masons believe, if I understand, if I understand them right, that when that stone uh, finds its way to Jerusalem, it's one of the last items necessary, uh, and that, that there are certain rabbinical orders, to the, actually, that I've met today that are anticipating its return. They, what, you know... Once it returns, then they proceed with a with a, a blueprint to uh, to uh, you know take the Temple Mount and and put up the what they consider to be the final temple that Ezekiel described. But the stone is it's all pivotal upon the return of this stone because Solomon brought that stone in in the le in the traditions and legends in Judaism um, into the, in the his original temple and and upon it the the incense was burned in the fire. Uh, pan. According to Masonic author David Ovison, the word dollar comes from the German word taller, 
While there are many taller designs, one in particular is mentioned, with the image of Jesus Christ crucified on one side, while the reverse bears the image of a serpent on a cross and a reference to the book of Numbers from the Old Testament. In this account, the children of Israel had complained against God. The scripture says, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much of the people of Israel died. When they repented, God commanded Moses to erect a bronze serpent upon a pole, saying that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. In the New Testament, Jesus made reference to the bronze serpent as a picture of his crucifixion. He said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Some believe that the serpent cross is the original inspiration for the American dollar sign today. While the image of the bronze serpent holds a very particular meaning for Christianity. David Ovison explains that Kabbalists and alchemists find an interesting parallel in the Hebrew gematria. The Hebrew word for the serpent of Moses is nakash, which means the shining one. The numerical gematria for nakash is 358. This is also the numerical equivalent for the Hebrew word Mashiach or Messiah. Ovison claims that these numerical equivalents allowed magicians to draw a connection between the brazen or bronze serpent and the Messiah. But exactly what Messiah do they mean? The phrase e pluribus unum, or out of many, one, appears in the banner held in the mouth of the American eagle. The word one appears a total of seven times on the dollar bill. Ovison writes, In magical numerology, the number seven is regarded with a special veneration. Certain texts that deal with the meanings of numbers insist that seven stands for the complete temple. The temple he refers to is the ancient temple of God, built by King Solomon in the city of Jerusalem. Ovison goes on to say that the concept of a complete temple is symbolized by the unfinished pyramid of the Great Seal, where the symbol of a Messiah figure is also shown with the all-seeing eye, representing the capstone that will one day complete the pyramid. In other words, when the Messiah emerges, then will the temple be complete. But just who this Messiah will be is the subject of intense debate, and the clues to his identity are said to be related to the temple itself. The site of Solomon's original temple at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem is still considered a sacred and holy place. Buildings are sacred in religions. Religious buildings are sacred. So Solomon's temple is sacred. The Knights Templar were specifically named in reference to this ancient site. They were known as the Poor Knights of Christ and of the Temple of Solomon. The Knights Templar lived on the Temple Mount. Today, the Temple Mount has on it the Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque. The Knights Templar had their headquarters in Al-Aqsa Mosque when they were there. So the association between this arcane direction and tradition in Europe with the Knights Templar and the temple of the Temple Mount is direct. The sacred nature of the temple was handed down from the Templars to the Freemasons, who are said to have originated from the ancient Knights. Masonic philosopher Albert Pike wrote that every Masonic lodge is a temple of religion. Another Masonic philosopher, Albert Mackey, wrote that of all the objects which constitute the Masonic science of symbolism, the most important, the most cherished by the Mason, and by far the most significant, is the Temple of Jerusalem. The spiritualizing of the Temple is the first, the most prominent, and the most pervading of all the symbols of Freemasonry. 
take from Freemasonry its dependence on the temple, and the system itself would at once decay and die. According to David Ovison, who is himself a Freemason, the dream of a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem is the true symbolism of the unfinished pyramid on the back of the dollar bill. But is it merely a coincidence that these symbols would end up on the foundation of America's currency? Is there a further connection with Solomon's Temple and the mysterious Knights Templar? The Templars were there on the mount. They lived on the mount. So they were living a dream. And the dream is the same dream Christopher Columbus had and wrote about extensively in returning to Jerusalem with the gold from the Americas to build the temple. Was this the true purpose of Columbus's voyage? To finance the rebuilding of Solomon's temple? And was this desire handed down from the Templars to Columbus to modern masonry? As we have shown before, the ships of Columbus sailed with a red cross on a white background the symbol of the Knights Templar. But despite the interest of Templars and Freemasons, the original temple begins with the Jewish people. The temple was critical to Judaism. It was the heart of Judaism. The first Jewish temple built by King Solomon was destroyed by the Babylonians in 587 BC. The temple became a necessity for the existence of Judaism. So when it was destroyed, the longing for another temple in, in the Babylonian exile was, you know, primary. The foundation for a second temple was laid by Zerubbabel when the first Jews returned from their captivity in ancient Babylon. First thing, when, when Jews are able to return, they build a temple. There's Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah come together there's a, a temple built. It's added on to over the centuries until you end up with Herod's temple. The second temple was in existence during the time of Christ and the apostles, but it would also be destroyed, a terrible event that Jesus himself had prophesied. The scripture says that the disciples came to show Jesus the buildings of the temple, and Jesus said unto them, See ye not all of these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that its desolation is nigh. And so it came to pass that the second temple was destroyed with the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Yet in the aftermath of its terrible destruction would emerge the dream for a third temple and what some believe will be the final temple of all time. This arcane connection to Freemasonry has its roots in the longing for the temple, the longing for the final temple, for the ultimate temple where Haggayim, where non-Jews pray with Jews, as the old books, you know, the last old books of the Old Testament predict will happen. When does that temple get built. The idea of a final temple is shared both by Jewish leaders and the Freemasons. Yet the two groups disagree on exactly what the final temple would be. There is a common history here and a common longing. They'll never end up with the same temple. Jewish uh, wishes for the final temple really don't resemble what Masons want to have built on the Temple Mount, which is a replica of Solomon's Temple. With their mysterious rituals and secret practices, the Masons are often accused of intoxicating the world, making it drunk with ideas of a new age and a new world order, all of which are engineered toward the fulfillment of the new Atlantis envisioned by Sir Francis Bacon. Could it be that this is what lies behind the concept of a third and final temple? It, to me, makes perfect sense that the new Atlantis, as understood in the, in the Baconian tradition, 
involves the final temple. The spiritual headquarters, if you will, of the new, of the new Atlantis. The idea of that temple is central to Freemasonry, the Knights Templar, the, and of this there is no doubt. The, the, they've all expressed it. Uh, all these arcane societies have let it be known that this is really, ultimately, a central goal. They seem to all gravitate toward there being a, a temple, a need for a temple, except Orthodox Muslims who say, no, we're the last religion. These buildings are fine, thank you very much. Become a Muslim and you can pray in them and hang out on the Temple Mount, which is not going to happen. So that leads to a pretty ugly likelihood. If people who want a temple get their way, there's going to be a, there's going to be a bloodbath there. Also, I believe it's spiritual because Satan has always desired God's place. That's why in Masonry you have Jebulon right there on the altar, Baal, the ruler of demons in the Masonic altar. And Masons are generally, obviously, you know, being deceived. However, right there on the Temple Mount in Israel, you have the Dome of the Rock and you know, the Golden Dome, the Black Dome. And within these domes, you have statements right there on Israel's Temple Mount, statements that Allah is God and, and you know, Allah has no, or God has no son and Muhammad's his prophet, a denial of the true God and his son, Jesus Christ. And again, that's what 1 John identifies as being the spirit of Antichrist, those that deny the Father and the Son, 1 John chapter 2. And that's a harbinger of the ultimate Antichrist to come, who's going to sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So isn't it interesting? Here we have Benjamin Krim speaking of a coming Maitreya, who will rule as the coming Imam Mahdi of Islam. Of course, that can't, he can't really rule and there can't be world peace unless the Jews in his mind are annihilated. And by the way, according to Muslim teachings uh, in the Hadiths, uh, you know, when the Imam Mahdi comes or when the Messiah comes, he will destroy uh, the Jews and the people of the cross. So all of this stuff, incredibly, I mean, it fits together just too well. But praise God, because from my perspective as a Christian, Jesus Christ said, when you see these things beginning to take place, lift up your head for redemption is drawing near. And I believe these are signs that, that Jesus Christ is coming again. And when he does come, he will defeat the Antichrist and every knee will bow and every tongue confess, including, including Benjamin Krim, including uh, the leaders of Iran and, and uh, Hezbollah and so forth. Whether it's in heaven or on earth or in hell, every knee will bow, declaring that Jesus Christ is Lord in the end. And what will all these things mean for the future destiny of America? According to David Ovison, it was Manley Hall who influenced the placement of 72 stones on the Great Pyramid of the Dollar Bill. Since the number 72 is said to be a magical number in the occult. It was also Hall who taught that the American Eagle was a cleverly disguised phoenix bird. In his writings, he documents this account from the first century AD. There is a certain bird which is called a phoenix and when the time of its dissolution draws near that it must die, it builds itself a nest. But as the flesh decays, a certain kind of worm is produced. According to this account, it is from this worm that the phoenix is reborn. This concept of a phoenix worm in its nest seems to be represented at the top of this column on a building found in Europe. But in Washington, D.C., up at the tops of the 72 columns of the National Archives building, we find nearly identical carvings, all perched beneath the throne of destiny itself. Could this somehow be a veiled reference to the secret destiny of America. Watching the strength of the American dollar decline, we consider America's founder, George Washington. Around his image on the face of the dollar is said to be an omega symbol, signifying the end. But what end? Many researchers have come to believe that the plan of these Luciferian societies is that 
like the Phoenix of old, the America that we know will ultimately be destroyed and that from her ashes will be born a new world order.